Oh, you painted it. I painted it. Yes, oh, my Oh, Ben. Yeah. Oh, so proud of you. Yeah, thank you. It's Gosh. Seen straight out of Fargo, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Any, anywho, I suppose that's a perfect time to. Oh, wait, what's that? That's the music playing us in. Perfect. Good timing. Uh, yeah, that's good. Although I always say that, and I feel like by now it's fading out. Whereas in my mind, this theater of the mind thing, I feel like it's fading in. But no, it's actually fading out by now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I suppose that means it's time to start this new episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. Welcome to everyone. I'm Ben. I'm Justin. We are the co-founders of Storyboard Media, your guides on the journey to practicing effective video for business. We're like the rolled Amundsen for your expedition to the South Pole. Because that's, that's a thing. Yeah. He did that. Well, he was the first one to, first, to head down there. First one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm I've, more of a, uh, what's oh, what's his name? Shackleton. Shackleton fan. See, yeah. I think we're going to run out of famous guides at some point. So yeah. I didn't want to put Amundsen and Shackleton in the same teaser there. Yeah. Because we're going to probably have to, I feel like I'm still kind of in the Midwestern. I'm trying hard not to. <laughs> <laughs> this might be the one. <clears throat> okay. Yes. This, this is our Midwestern <laughs> accent episode. Um, so yeah. Anyway. Um, for those of you watching on Instagram Live or watching the video version of this podcast, welcome to our new studio. Hey. And I suppose anyone listening, welcome to our new studio also. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear a difference. There's um, a little buzz, uh, and that's from our our new sign back is, I See, I've lost that register of my hearing. I can't hear it buzzing. A little bit. Got a little buzz? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we moved into a new office, uh, first floor of the same building, but we did it so that we could get the studio. So... Here we are recording our first thing ever in the studio. Available for rent. So yes, also available for rent, downtown Durham. Just name your price. <laughs> um, all right, so um, today we're gonna be talking about video creation at scale. Mm -hmm. um, should be kind of an interesting freeform discussion. Uh, before we dive in though, I would like to welcome our brand new sponsor. Um, our sponsor today is The Old 98. Not a whole lot of context there, but um, I have a good authority that their ad is uh, ad is pretty good. So stick around, listen for the ad later in the uh, episode. The old 98s. The old 98s, yes, okay. our new sponsor. All right. The old 98s. Not to be confused with the old 97s, which is, I think, like. Well, that was my football number. Thing. Oh, you were the old 97. Yeah. Huh? Number now 97. You're, now you're the old 97. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How many knee surgeries later? I've had two. Two, okay. So I had three knee surgeries. And last week your theory was that one of them was a fake surgery? Yeah, like a placebo. A placebo <laughs> surgery. Yeah. You don't have to have an ACL um, to, to function. And uh, I just don't think they put one in there. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, oh, right. Sorry. One more bit of housekeeping. Uh, I think we started mentioning this in the last couple episodes. But I would like to mention that we can keep coming up with ideas mm -hmm. for the podcast. We can keep coming up with topics for the next several years, probably. It's not that we so much have them planned out so far. We usually think of it like day before. Um, but we would like to, and, and they are topics we think our audience would benefit from, but we'd just as soon hear from you. So if our audience would like to share with us through any means necessary, um, what they would like to hear about, what they'd like to hear us talk about, any questions that they've got, anything we can you know, enlighten, uh, them on, we'd love to hear. So, comments, people call texts. me all the time with like little questions or whatever. Like, hey, we're hiring our first person. You know, what do you think about this? Oh, um, I thought that was a job offer. <laughs> we're hiring our first video person. Can we tear you away from storyboard media? Um, but like, that's that's a great topic. And so we now we have a series based on how to hire or hiring whatever position. So. Um, but anything, throw it at us. We'd love to, to roll that into some new episode, con new content. Yeah. All right. So um, that's the housekeeping. Shall we dive into video creation at scale? Yeah. This is, this is actually, I mean, it's maybe obvious that this was coming, like the scaling of video. Sure. Uh, but it was part of your, uh, one of your trends that you brought up and seeing a lot more quantity over quality. Maybe. Yeah, I, I, hate, I hate to to say it's quantity over quality, but the the volume of content needs to be considered over the quality of the content. So I, I guess it is quant quantity over. It, it's not 
a lack of quality. Sure, it's just that you're ramping up the quantity, and quality may be right. suffering a little bit or, or a lot of it, but or maintaining the quality, yeah, which is tough to do. Yeah, and so um, if this is something that, that we talked about on our Trends episode. It's something that even with one of our clients we're working on right now. I mean, we, oh, yeah. we, just, we <clears throat> just charted out visually uh, for one of our clients, I think it ended up being like 268 total pieces of video content. Mm -hmm. but not, the, even, not even including promo pieces right. or anything. Yes. Those are all just like... 268 separate videos. Yeah. And because one of the pieces of the manifesto is to be specific, a lot of this is about being, being specific, but there's a lot of scale in this. So, you know, we get our first 39 videos of that 268 by basically writing seven videos, mm -hmm. you know, one for each kind of core solution. And then we get to make slight scalable tweaks. Mm -hmm. Like to, what? To, we may change one line. Mm -hmm. we, may, we may go from, you know, a solution for all of your blank needs to a solution for all of your blank needs in the e-commerce industry. Right. That all of a sudden makes that particular e-commerce video much more relevant to that particular yep. viewer. But we're starting with that kind of core piece, that industry agnostic piece of content. But then we just make these subtle changes. And it could even be something like, like title. it could be a title, it could be a color scheme that's added in post or mm -hmm. changed in post. But we go from like these seven videos, and then all of a sudden we're able to add, you know, five or six industries. Mm -hmm. And we've got that first big batch. And then it's about making 32 more core videos and then like 156 versions of that. This you know, is, and that's just one version of scaling video content because right. it comes in a lot of different ways. Yes, which I think we're going to talk about. Yeah. And a lot of this, so a lot of this information, or like, kind of the the kindling for this conversation came from Vidyard's recently released uh, video trends of 2020. Yeah, we kind of had our eyes out for the state of video and business. Yeah, video report, benchmarks, something. which which was which dropped about a year ago. So we kind of had our eye out for that, and then thought this was that at first. Mm -hmm. We've talked to Vidyard, and that report is actually coming out in May. So we'll be doing an, ep an upcoming episode where we kind of dive into that. But but as we got and, and and then of course we realized that we had just done our trends episodes right. in December and January. So we didn't want to just go over the the Vidyard trends because we, we've already it's shared our trends. Bit, There's yeah. a lot of overlap. Yeah. But one of the first. Uh, trends of the five trends that they identify is scaling video creation. Mm -hmm. And so it just seems that it's worth to kind of jump into that. I think before they even get to that as a solution, one of my favorite parts of, of that whole report is this, it's kind of the end of the introduction, but it's their fundamental question that businesses need to be asking. And I don't want to paraphrase it, but I've got it here. Quote, in 2020, Businesses need to move beyond questions like, why video? Or, how do I get going? The big question they'll need to start answering is, how do I make video a natural, integrated, and strategic part of how our business engages our audiences? And to me, this is, this is separating the, the laggards, mm -hmm. right? Anybody who's still out there asking, well, why should I be doing video? Did, or like, how do I get started? Like, w fine. Yeah. But we're so far past them. Yep. And our listeners should be so far past that point. Because <coughs> let's be honest, that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. Video is everywhere. You can't just be like, ooh, how do I get into this now? Right. Well, you, you can, but you you're, can. You're, in a different, you're in a different playground altogether. Yeah. Well, and you've been saying for about two years now, what happens in two years? when everybody's doing video, are you gonna be you still figuring it out at that point? Or yeah. are you gonna have two years of experience where you've learned what works yeah. and what doesn't? And so we're kind of getting to that point. So I just think that's a fundamental question that, that also was very interestingly mimicked in my inbox this morning because I got an email from Wistia and the subject of that email was how to, how to start my first video series mm -hmm. or something. And so it was just in, in preparing for this and looking at that, you know, setting aside the like how to get started. Vidyard is setting aside the yeah. how to get started. Completely and Wistia audiences. is, and they're completely different audiences, but it just, that is such a great way. And, 
and and there's this whole video maturity um model that that vidyard likes to put out there and and you can kind of assess yourself but like people are moving toward those more mature uh you know advanced platforms you looking at advanced mm -hmm. analytics those kinds of things so that stuff is not like coming it's here and then of course one way to make video a natural integrated and strategic part of how our video our business engages our audience is video creation at scale I think a way to to do this episode is I, I've I've noted a couple sentences, paragraphs in here that I think are just fantastic points mm -hmm. and kind of a launching point for us for for some discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can kind of weave in, you know, any examples like, you know, our client example that we already got mm -hmm. into to go from, you know, seven videos to 268 or whatever. But one of the first pieces that jumped out at me in terms of the video creation at scale is until now most businesses have only dabbled in video leveraging agencies and specialized resources to produce videos as required but as customer and employee expectations change so too must your approach in the years ahead if your team and in teams and individuals aren't able to create video content as efficiently as designing a pdf building a presentation or even typing out an email you risk missing out on the massive opportunity that video presents yeah Sorry. Uh, no, that I, th that's it. And, okay. and I just, that, I have not seen that stark a comparison. I mean, think about how marketing teams used to do PowerPoint presentations. I mean, I'm thinking like back in the 60s, if you needed something typed up, you sent it to the fourth floor where they yeah. had a couple people who did type typing. Now everybody is doing that on the fly, like without even thinking about it. Right. And it's just second nature. You're doing it on your phone. You're doing it multiple places. You're doing it at a register. You're doing it here on your computer. You're doing it on your phone. You're doing it on your tablet at home. Like, that's just something we all do all day long. Yep. That is what video is going to be in the in the near future. And and there's a whole lot that has to go into that too because, well, one, I think you're seeing the workforce, the younger part of the workforce, are the people who've had video they're very comfortable with it right i mean it's it there isn't that um it it was never for them anything that was just in the realm of some professional right um and so you've got people coming into the workforce who just know how to utilize communicate with video so yep. whether it's like a one-to-one -one sales video or doing a really interesting you know instagram story for your brand something like that i mean it's just so natural, but on the flip side of that coin, everybody's just so used to consuming all mm -hmm. of that content mm -hmm. that that there is that kind of acceptance of. And I think this goes to the quantity over quality piece a little bit too. You can do an Instagram story on your phone for your brand that's really effective. Sure. As long as you know why you're doing it and what you're trying to accomplish with it, like it doesn't have to be professionally shot, right. all that kind of stuff. It can be that scrappy stuff. So there's still, a quality there that may not be a production quality. There's a value there mm -hmm. in in the purpose of the piece, in the action that you want to bring about in people. You know that quality is still there, but you can knock out 15 seconds at a time, mm -hmm. a dozen of those. Yeah. But yeah, I was just really struck by this this kind of novel comparison. I mean, it, to me, it's it's one of those like, oh, of course, why hadn't I thought of that before? Like it's a no-brainer evolution of video mm -hmm. um, that's going to make it not only more necessary but more expected. One of the things that we do uh, to help our clients practice more effective video and to do it at scale is to create, uh, one, I think creating series helps push you down that road a little bit because yep. you know that you're going to be releasing X amount over the next six weeks, whatever it is, um, and you can you can kind of batch a lot of that stuff. But then also creating these, uh, for lack of a, I mean, I have a better term, but like templates almost. Mm -hmm. um, so every time your video, like a, a video from your company starts, it should have this sort of branding, and this right. sort of like sonic or, or audio. audio um, bing, bing. Yeah, yeah, whatever it is. You should have that stuff that's just canned and ready to go so that all you have to do is throw in the right video clips. You know, if there's a particular m music or types of music you like to use, you should have a pile of those. You should have your branding stuff done and ready to go. 
and you know openers for the sh- the show. You know, I think we're gonna we don't even know what our opener is gonna look like for this yet. But right, uh, we've been playing around with a bunch of stuff. But now we're gonna have that, and now we just have to fit in the video and audio clips. Yeah, and we then we wrap it all together. So having some of that stuff uh, ready can help you scale your video content. Mm-hmm. And make it easier for more more people who may be less technically trained mm-hmm. to contribute to the video content that your organization is producing. Because mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily have to fall to one person to shoot it and edit it yeah. and release it. Uh, there could be an entire team, and I think we get to this a little bit later on, where a lot of people are actually contributing to then. Yeah. The individual piece everyone's going to be expect just like everyone yeah. has to type their own shit out on their keyboard. Yeah. You're going to be doing your own video, even even if you're an engineer, it's going to be about communicating to the other engineers in your team. Yeah, about why an update took place or something. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. So the next uh, little paragraph that that I called out um, in 2020, businesses will accelerate investments in the people processes and technology required to scale video content creation in a way that meets the needs of different business units in an efficient way. I think that business, different business units Mm -hmm. is a key part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. These investments will involve a multifaceted approach to supporting a wide range of video types from employee communications to timely social media posts to online brand experiences. I think we've started talking about this a little bit in some of our previous episodes. But how, and of course, how just even how we position ourselves, right? There's, there's video for marketing, for sales, for customer success. Of course, there's internal employee communications, there's HR and recruiting opportunities. And so until so recently, everybody just kind of looked at the marketing department right. whenever anybody said video. Yeah, yeah. And so organizations seem to be going one of two ways. They seem to be either um, enabling and empowering each individual business unit to create their own video content or they're all looking to marketing but marketing is expecting them to look at them Mm -hmm. and say okay i know i need to be doing hr and recruiting stuff for Mm -hmm. that team i know i need to be doing stuff for the sales team i know i need to be doing this top level marketing stuff for us i know i need to be doing so i i don't think we've necessarily seen enough of it play out yet where we know which of those two models is more effective i my guess is that there's some evolution of the marketing department that they become there's going to be a responsible for it yes yes because it's it's impossible for them to create a personalized video from a salesperson to a prospect it's impossible right they can't do that but Um, they can create content that the sales team would specifically use that may not be you at scale Yep. that may not be used in a marketing standpoint right. or video content for the customer service team or customer support team. Mm-hmm. I think ideally you have that video budget and video resources. I don't want to say department um, within each of the business units so that there's someone kind of primarily responsible for vetting the content that's going out for that department. Um, and mm-hmm. then you, you get to kind of keep it a okay. little bit more self-enclosed. Um, but you still gotta have that that top level brand consistency that right. you were talking about. Like right, the, someone's you know, in, gotta be in charge of that. Yeah. Which I think marketing, because it's a it would be a brand thing. Yeah. Marketing would be in, in charge of that, but, um, but yeah, like a, a, there will be a sales video officer and a right. customer success video officer. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness, it looks like it's time for our sponsor. I've been spot. looking forward to it. All right. The Old 98s. Nostalgic for mid to late 90s post grunge alternative music, but can't ever remember which band did which songs. Was that Tonic? Toadies? Third Eye Blind? The Old 98s is a new 90s tribute band made up of members from some of your favorite forgotten post grunge bands. The bassist from Space Hog, got him. The guitarist from Candlebox, yep. Another guitarist from Collective Soul, you bet. Forgot those were different bands, we're the band for you. Drummer from Dishwalla, you know it. Hype man from Our Lady Peace, amen brother. Ezra from Better Than Ezra, sure why not. 
The old 98s. Wishing we had better lawyers before we were famous for those 15 minutes we were famous. Coming soon to a surprisingly small local music venue near you. The old 98s. Yeah, they're at the Crash Cat- Cat's Cradle coming up. One of the downsides to attending these is there are so many members in the band yes. that only like seven or, I mean, it depends how you look at it, but only like seven or eight people, depending on the venue, can afford, you know, be, afford to be in there. Yeah, yeah. With fire codes. And yeah, the band is usually larger than the audience. Yeah. Yeah. But that's okay. I felt I felt very special. They were surrounding me. Yes. Like me and like four other people. Yeah. Well, and because you have to have been born between like March of 1980 and like June of 1984 to like really have been there the first time these songs were popular. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're kind of perfectly timed for like... The old millennials. That old, like the old millennials, the the last Gen Xers, like myself, for mm-hmm. example, who grew up like turning on DC 101 in the morning mm-hmm. and hearing these songs and being like, oh, haven't I heard the song before? No, it's a brand new one from <laughs> Toad the Wet Sprocket. Yeah. And now, however many years later it is, they just really all sound the same. They start, yeah. Yeah. Well, the most impressive part to me about the performance was how it was essentially just one long song Mm -hmm. with each of those old one-hit wonders as like a different movement within the song. Mm -hmm. And they just seamlessly blended from like one track to the next. And the whole thing was over in like 36 minutes. Yeah, very soothing. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, you rock hard. That nostalgia, (laughs) right? Yes. Yes. So, welcome to our new sponsor, the old 98. See him at the Cat's Cradle sometime, probably. Yeah. Um, if not Cat's Cradle, or that may be too large a venue. Maybe they bumped down to the local 506. Yeah. Might be a better size venue. Or shooters. For, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, keep an eye out now. They're on tour. Uh, not to be confused, of course, with the old 97s, which is an actual band. Is it really? Yes. Yeah. But, you know, 98 is when so many of these songs came out. Of course, I was a senior in high school in 98. Yeah. So, like, a lot of this is just, like... That was my time. Yeah. So I think that's why they reached out to me. Okay. For okay. this one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, right. Welcome, welcome to our sponsor, yeah. the old 98. Back to our podcast. The next section I called out here, I think is, is closely connected to what we were talking about a minute ago. Marketing teams will add dedicated in-house video production resources to support evolving content strategies. Content writers will balance their time between traditional long-form content and writing video scripts. Social media marketers will advance their video editing capabilities to help scale video creation and customization for different social networks. I mean, you can take this model of websites themselves or blogs, and then, you know, the evolution from blogs to like eBooks and guides. Like we can see what happened with all of this stuff Mm -hmm. historically it's happening and going to happen with video. Mm -hmm. So all of the money and resources that companies have put into content creation, thinking about written content creation, is now just slowly shifting, actually pretty quickly shifting Mm -hmm. toward video content. It's not that it necessarily replaces any of that. And I think that's what this is really saying is, you've got a lot of the people in place in your organization who have the skills to apply to I know where you're going. I can tell by your face. I know where you're going with this. I mean, that's true. There's a lot that needs to be uh, imparted still. Like, just because you can write a blog post does not mean you're a good screenwriter. But if you're a good writer of blog posts, you're probably a pretty good writer, which means you can learn how to write a script for a video more easily than... Because bringing in someone to start with video scripts without any writing experience at all. Yeah, like Marshall McLuhan. Do you know Marshall McLuhan? Um, <clears throat> he, he said the, the media is the message. The medium is the message. So mm-hmm. you're you're using video in a whole do, whole new way. And to think about it with that dynamic like shift, it takes a lot to go from writing words to writing words, images, sounds, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Yeah. So that's just one person. This is the writer, but then I don't think you. I don't think you. Where else can current uh, roles be transferred to video roles? 
Well, I, I think the easiest one is just salespeople. Okay. Right? And, and all you're doing there is changing what you're communicating from an email or a phone call to a video mm -hmm. chat or a video message, mm -hmm. right? Which, as we've discussed before, but is worth repeating, the video part of it allows you to show and tell. Mm -hmm. If you're calling someone, you're probably going to get their voicemail. And if you leave a voicemail, because I don't know anybody who leaves voicemails God, anymore. do not leave me a voicemail. Um, you know, you've probably got a basically scripted kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And even if you get them, you've got a, a sales script that you're going to kind of work through once you get to that person yeah. to some extent. Outline, right? yeah. You know, some, some idea of, of what, what you've talked about with them before, where you want to get them to go, yeah. the yeah. next decision you want them to make, next commitment you want them to make. But you can either write that up in an email or, or phone, you know, call someone, or you can share that through a video. So again, we're not talking about like, in this case, highly produced video content, no. but just leveraging video as a medium to share more information. And it's still novel enough that people are connecting with it. And it's not as commonplace as voicemail. I would say become. it's, so, yes, it is still novel. So from a cold outreach, it works very effectively. Yeah. It's, but it's, it's beyond novel, it's just more effective. So I think that's the main reason to start using it as a communication tool, not just a sales outreach for it, like SDRs kind right. of thing. But, but I have a message to share with you. If you can see me and see the conviction in my, my face, my body language, all that stuff, that helps so much more convey what you're trying to say. And, and I think too, look at, um, look at our weekly updates for our clients. Yep. That's something our project manager usually do, mm -hmm. does, which means right now, you and I are doing most of them. And yet, over the last few weeks, we've had David take on a couple. And so he's reluctantly, like everyone, I think, who's new to video, mm -hmm. taking that on. But it's, you know, Did he you went Anthony from- Did you tell Anthony yet that he's doing those for contractors? You can tell him. <laughs> um, but, you know, David in his like third week of, of weekly updates <clears throat> came in and, and did them in here. Mm -hmm. Right, which which was, even though he was using a webcam, a much better look mm -hmm. because he had great light coming in through the window, which we have blacked out right now. He had one of the you know one of the hair lights on. Mm -hmm. He didn't even really know what he was doing. Yeah, but he just kind of sat down in the studio room, and it sounded better and looked better than most of the stuff that we did from our desk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So even just that awareness and just learning little things, mm -hmm. even if you're not using like a cinema camera or a DSLR to shoot it, moving your laptop into a sound treated room, an interesting looking space, right? Where the light mm -hmm. is right is also gonna have that much more of an effect because there's so much more video content happening. And again, when you look at scaling, this is, this is taking video content for your organization that's made by like one department and managed by like three or four people to empowering your entire group of employees to utilize video to mm -hmm. communicate and they're communicating your brand and whether those are one-to-many messages or one-to-one -one messages that scale mm -hmm. right i yeah. mean that is, that is how you scale if you can take one one producer that you just hired is not going to help you scale video correct. effectively you need adopt rapid adoption across the, yes. the company training your 150 salespeople mm -hmm. to utilize video in their cadence that helps you scale. And you don't yeah. even necessarily have to hire someone to do yeah. that, right? You just sign up for the platform, put them through the onboarding. You could just figure it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what a lot of the early adopters did. They didn't have anybody to train them. Yeah. There are people who will train that sort of thing these days. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> next. So last little snippet that, that jumped out to me in this uh, section was, as video evolves from being a promotional content medium this is what we were just talking about, to a communication platform for businesses and individuals, the way we think about it is fundamentally changing. There's more, but to me, that like, that rings true with the beginning of the manifesto. We're redefining the word video, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Much like employees are expected to create emails, documents, and presentations today, they will start to be empowered to capture and share videos to improve the way they communicate. We have already talked about this in the other pieces. This, this is a... <clears throat> this sentiment is a big reason why, well, there's some writing on the wall for a lot of 
video production companies. Yes. Which is, you better hope some big software company either acquires you <laughs> or or you just decides they don't want to do any, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but, but production, big P production, High is, level production is going to be become go from a market like this to this because yeah. so much is going to be happening in house and i've and i've seen this stuff coming we have for a couple of years now yeah. which is why strategy was the like the best place for us to start building our foundation that's why i keep trying to like we're working through some positioning and messaging work from our uh, for storyboard media but helping companies create a video culture i mean mm-hmm. this the uh, vi- creating a video culture is the, the best way to think about it. You're going. you everyone in your company needs to adopt this, and it's not going to happen overnight. But, but you need to start ad- adopting it. And there are smart ways to do it. There are really stupid ways to do it. You don't put your execu- you know, account executives on video without telling them how it works or what they're gonna mm-hmm. they're gonna screw up a, you know, six digit sale, um, or or not. They could lock it up too. But it's just sure. a, it's a big risk. Yeah. Um, but. It's all about creating that culture. Um, even you know, at our company, we've all decided it's best if we can all pitch in to some of the social media content that we create, rather than just making one person do it. Right. And you get a lot of different flavors in that video culture. Period. 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 Um, yeah, I don't know that I have anything else for that. <laughs> that was pretty good. Okay. All right. Um, so. <clears throat> You've got some some qu- so that's enough from the video video trends sure. report. And if you don't believe us, then just like if you don't believe that this is going to happen, then you can just sign off right now and not listen anymore. But I don't think if you're a listener, you're not really in that boat. Right. So we want to help you take those next steps. Yeah. So we we touched on this a little bit earlier. Who's ultimately responsible for? The seven phases. Yeah, of practicing effective I mean, video. Each, yes, each individual phase. Like, because I could see how, you know, a marketing department could be responsible for the overall video strategy for an entire organization, mm-hmm. and then you're empowering individuals within each business unit to be responsible for the big P production mm-hmm. level. Those three phases, and then um, in some cases it kicks back to the marketing department for distribution and promotion. In some cases, it's up to the creator of the video to distribute that video to the audience that it needs to go to. And then I imagine, regardless of who's creating your strategy, um, whether it's the marketing department or some content department or video Mm -hmm. czar or Mm -hmm. whomever, that's the the person or people who need to be analyzing what's working and, and what isn't. I think that's going to be maybe one of the hardest parts is aggregating all this content, especially when uh, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and you, everything's uploaded natively. So you've got all of these different platforms collecting information about your video, your, your viewers, yeah, and their interactions, and being able to collect all that stuff in one place to paint some bigger picture is going to be really difficult. Well, and, and Vidyard makes that point in the report, and I left it out because it feels a little self-serving. I know that that any content you create is allowed to be a little bit self-serving at times. Sure. But, but they have an entire section about how video technology is being centralized. And to me, that's exactly what you were just talking about, is how if you've got, you, you've now got these advanced hosting platforms and distribution platforms that that either centralize all of the information or centralize the distribution so that you can come in as someone in the marketing department and look at every individual person within your organization, mm-hmm. look at every single video that they're creating and sending out, and look at every single analytic. Or you can look at it from the top level and look at it as a library as a whole. Yeah. But you've actually, and you're you're able to share to YouTube, you're able to share to LinkedIn. Publish from Publish central, from that platform yeah. so that you're at least getting the information. You may not be getting all of the information you could get from a video that you emailed to someone directly. If you publish to LinkedIn or YouTube, you're still only gonna get the data 
that, that, LinkedIn, that collects. LinkedIn collects. Yeah. But at least it's all aggregated in one place. Right. And you don't have to go from from so I I deliberately left it out because it feels like Vidyard saying like us, but with us saying it, right? It's Vidyard, it's Brightcove, it's it's twenty three to some extent. They're really good about, you know, publishing to other platforms from their platform. Yeah. And so having the the people the right people at the right parts of the process to tie everything together, mm -hmm. I think is what's important there. Yeah. And then every organization, depending on how aligned their marketing and sales teams are, right? Because we've had plenty of clients where the marketing and sales teams are totally connected. Mm -hmm. And we've had clients or worked at companies where marketing and sales are just like, you do your Fighting job, I'll do my own, job. You give yeah. me more leads, you close more deals. Like, they just do not work together. Yeah. And so it's gonna be up to each individual organization to figure out how that all works. But putting a department or person or people in charge at several steps does help create a greater understanding mm -hmm. of what's working and what isn't. I do feel like there needs to be a centralized video team. It could be a team of one, yeah. or it could be a, a much bigger team, and they might share other responsibilities in the, in the company, but they should be responsible for strategy. And they should also be responsible for analysis. Yes. On both ends. But in between there, production is going to be an everybody thing. Mm -hmm. Some some stuff that happens in a studio, you might have you know subject matter experts or source material experts, um, or, or you know have specialized people who show up on camera continually uh, when you're doing bigger shoots. Uh, you probably hire actors for some things, but production will be a responsibility of everybody in the organization. Yes, and then I guess for that next layer of our of our pyramid, uh, the distribution promotion. Distribution, it's, it's up to that person who produced it and what channels they have and where their audience is. So the, the strategy should inform that and yeah. people should have an understanding, okay, I'm going to make this video on this platform, send it out this way, um, and then let that strategy team do their thing mm -hmm. in terms of like understanding what happens. Because I may, in cold outreach, or in cold outreach I may have to rely on embedding a video message into a into a LinkedIn in mail, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or it might be a prospect that I've been working for a while and we're working our way through that journey and I've got their email address, right? Right. I've got their phone number, I yep. could text them something if I wanted to. And so you just have to know which channel to use depending on the situation. And so somebody's just gotta be there to say, <clears throat> hey, salespeople, this is when to do this, this is when to do this. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm really intrigued by that that idea of like a video enablement team, a video, just an organization wide that can, business unit agnostic can bring like, video video ambassador. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So, what else can companies do to um, catch up to you know the early adopters who are really using this stuff, using video well, mm -hmm. or, or even just accelerate their, their video programs, um, what can they do, uh, what can companies do to get there? I think... Um, What's something that like every company is gonna need to have? I think every company needs to, I, I don't, I, I keep going back and forth between like the physical resources that are required, mm -hmm and like the training resources that are required. Mm -hmm. But like every company should have a room like this. Mm -hmm. For it. those of you who are watching, a room like this. For those of you who are listening, a room like this. I don't know, I thought that might bring a little echo into it and they could kind of feel the room, but. <laughs> um, and uh, where it's a controlled environment where somebody can do something better than just sitting at their desk yeah. on their webcam kind of thing at any given time. Yep. Whether it is an SME, a salesperson, a, a customer support the rep, CEO. a CEO, whomever. Then of course there are, are you know additional physical components of lights and cameras and I mean, you may need to distribute decent webcams to your sales force. Yeah. Depending right. on what kind of computer they're using. Yeah, I mean, if if you're if you're giving them MacBooks when they start on day one, 
those all have a webcam included that's mm-hmm. probably good enough to use. Yeah, for, for sure. Right? It's a great camera. But, you know, if if you're, you know, giving them a desktop connected to a monitor and a cubicle, you may have to give them a webcam. So there's yeah. those physical things that are, again, it's scale. It's buying 150 webcams instead of, like, building a $100,000 studio. Right. Right? It's it's make a, a 1500 or $10,000 room and then buy 150 webcams. But then, to me, there's that, like, there's that education and training element of, like, one, convincing 150 salespeople why they should be using video to communicate, mm-hmm. and then just giving them in an hour or two the basics of how to do it right. Mm-hmm. Um, how to craft, like, so there's the how to appear on camera, right? Yeah. And, and how to act and what and to say, how camera. long your messages should be. Yeah. You know, all, all those, you know, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And then I think there has to be organizationally some kind of accountability from either sales managers or this video enablement team or someone to make sure that people are actually doing it. Because oftentimes, whether they're sales people uh, or other employees, it's, they revert, back. they revert back to what's worked for them before. Mm-hmm. And so no matter what kind of engagement numbers you can put in front of them on what, what their yeah. email response rates will be, without accountability, they're probably not going to start doing it. Yeah. Um, and you know, the good sales teams have good sales managers with good accountability. The bad sales teams, you know, oftentimes they're lacking mm-hmm. that, that accountability part of it mm-hmm. too. But to me, that's, that's you know, it's, it's physical, technical resources, education and training on why and how to do this simply up front, and then just that, again, a video czar or someone mm-hmm. saying, here's what's worked, here's what hasn't, What about uh, to help companies get either to the next level or a couple levels. What about platforms, software, some of that stuff? What are the things you have to have? I mean, I don't know I don't know that I have a good answer for that because to me when I think of like editing a video together, even just for social, if it's not something that you're just filming live, I immediately go to Premiere or Final Cut Pro 10. Mm-hmm. But I know there's stuff between just a live uncut video mm-hmm. on Instagram and that. I haven't spent enough time in them to know what they are, but I know they're out there. Yeah. Um, there, I, I am constantly getting fed ads in my Instagram feed for these magical like video content generators where basically you like type in some of the text of like what you want your title to be and you know, a vibe and like some AI, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, select stock images and then makes a video yeah. for you. That could be, could be perfectly fine. I don't go within 10 yards of those things. Right. Um, well, cause they look, they all look the same. Yeah. And there's not a lot of value in blending in. Yeah. I'd rather see a meh lit video of an individual making a, um, a sales pitch directly to me mm-hmm. than some clearly Shitty stock image that some AI looking, made. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think on some level we've we've spent a lot of time talking about the one to one or one to few type mm-hmm. of video messaging that happens across the organization. Yeah, it could happen externally with prospects, clients. It could happen uh, internally with communicating with your teams who are in another city. There's some software out there that makes this really simple and it's free you can pay money to to get better versions of it but um but i know vidyard's go video is great wistia has soapbox Mm -hmm. which has its own uh pluses and and you know pros and cons um pluses and benefits is probably what they'd rather (laughs) hear yeah um let's see there's bomb bomb there's loom there's uh, even Drift has some video mm-hmm. messaging. Uh, and HubSpot's got video messaging included, but it's yeah. powered by Vidyard. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, like all of those that I mentioned have free free ways to do it. Um, it gets better and better if you pay decide to pay for it. But I think it's a great way to get started. So that's not a whole lot mm-hmm. um, uh, investment. Right. If you're going to have an in-house production team, you should have a computer that some some a lot of editing can take place on a perfectly 
regular MacBook Pro. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'll need that software like uh, Premiere Pro, yeah. whatever. But, um, but most of the stuff, like in terms of just becoming better communicators with like internally and externally, there's free stuff out there for them. Other things that can help um, help people get to the next step and be able to, so that they can scale their video. I do go, I do go back to the brand assets. Um, it's a great, I mean, this is such a cynical way to look at it, but like creating well-polished brand ass video brand assets that you can give anybody to use really polishes a turd. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, if you put the the logo sting on the front end and the back end of a like cell phone shot video, it's just gonna make the whole thing feel mm-hmm. better. Yeah. Um, and I almost hate saying it, but like, like you you create that stuff so that uh, everything has a consistent feel, but also has like an intention behind it. Right, it feels like somebody took some effort yes. and made this a thing, even if it looked shitty in the middle. But it was a valid message to me, whether it was a one-to-one message or a one-to-many message. Regardless of that quality, it you know what? It started well, it ended well. I know what brand it was for, and I know what they want me to do. I can use that, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that's something that that is so overlooked. I mean, we got plenty of clients who have multiple video vendors. And you can just yeah. tell when some stuff was made by one vendor and some mm-hmm. stuff was made by an, by another because they just use different logos things. They use different color palettes. They use different lower thirds. They use whatever it is. I, and I'm, I'm so surprised because v- video is becoming ubiquitous. Every every company who's gone through some sort of branding exercise with a, with, a, with professionals they have brand guidelines, but that to this day I have not seen a company hand me a video brand guideline. We've created them and handed them to, we've, to clients, that's one, that's, but we've never been handed one. But that they should have that. It should be. It should not just be like here's the opening and closing. Yeah. It's here's the kind of music you should use. Here's the transitions you should be using. I, you know, some of them either it's just a hard cuts only, no fades, yeah. or or it's. Um, um, we don't do this type of movement. It's all ninety degree edges, and well, and we could talk about. I mean, I'm just surprised. That it's I have not- so many issues with brand guidelines. So many brand guidelines are just written for the marketing department, mm-hmm. and you can tell, <clears throat> mm-hmm. right? Like, here's the appropriate spacing around our logo because it is, you know, point six one of the height of the first letter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like I don't like if I'm a salesperson. And I'm trying to put like a logo at the end of one of my videos. Ha- I I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, just give me the, the logo asset, asset yeah. without anything around it in that space or whatever, yeah. and I'll use it. Right. So I think so many brand guidelines are just so horribly written to be used across organizations. Anyway, that's something that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. But yes, video has to be video assets and video guidelines have to be a part of that <clears> just as much as for print or web or anything else that you're asking your employees to do. And if we've mentioned anything in this episode, it's that employee, individual employees are gonna be asked to create more content. Yeah. And expected to, and it's going to be expected. Every company is a media company. Yeah. It's just a rule. You have to be out there. You have to be sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your messages. Uh, If you don't do media, you don't exist. Yeah. And so, yeah, kind of on that brand, uh, the video branding guidelines, um, I think some rules around what gets posted to the company YouTube channel and what's private. Yeah. Um, Like, also something a company can do is just getting their YouTube channel cleaned up. So so many companies have this as just a big dump site where Mm -hmm. they just upload, upload, upload. There's no playlist created there's no thumbnails created there's no consistency with titling um i think we talked about this in our video audit episode like if you've got if you've got your like release for version 2.1 video out there and you're on version mm-hmm. 4.0 you're actually harming yourself yeah. because if people are searching for 
you know, information about your product. The way SEO works is the stuff that's been there. Part of how that's SEO proven. works the stuff that's is proven. the stuff that's proven, which part of that equation is stuff that's been there longer and utilized and, mm -hmm. and heavily viewed, is going to score higher than the newer stuff. Mm -hmm. And so by not taking down your version 2.1 product release video, you're harming the ability for people to see, mm -hmm. you know, what your platform does now. Um, I want to ask you about video ethics. Okay. How does video ethics play a role in all of this? Um, well, that's funny because I put it on there and I was going to ask you that. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by video ethics, which is why I wanted to ask it because I, I didn't know what you meant. I kind of meant it in like guidelines, but um, as like sort of like the brand guidelines. Is this like Tethics? What's that again? Oh, yeah. Tech ethics. Tech ethics. <laughs> from, from Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, let's see. I jotted it down just kind of in, in like a stream of consciousness. It might just be part of guidelines again, but what, how does your brand need to be communicated, like presented externally, internally? How, how are you using video? Are you using it um, to like shame somebody in the company because they're not doing something mm -hmm. or, or I don't know, like there's, I think there's something about the video ethics. I, I haven't thought more about it than just writing it down on, on the show well, notes. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I could see that empowering so many individuals with the power of video mm -hmm. could be potentially dangerous. Yes, yeah. and as a company, you have to establish what you yeah. know, the ethics behind usage. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe that's Storyboard Media will be a video ethics company in five years. Yeah, Vethics. Vethics. Vid vid ticks? No. So, let's say we're st somehow if they don't knock this building down, and we're here three years from now having a very early twenty twenty three conversation, and you're really happy about the way video has gone over the past three years as companies have maybe they haven't scaled as much as we thought, but like, mm -hmm. but you're really happy with the way it's gone. What has happened in those three years to make you as a video evangelist, video fan, mm -hmm. uh, to make you so happy? Um, well, I think part of the first part of my answer goes to the first question that was posed by Vidyard in this report is that people are thinking, how do I make video a natural integrated part of my communication with my employees and my customers and prospects? as opposed to why should I be using video? Mm -hmm. How is I, in three years, I don't want to have to cite to any potential client how open rates increase, mm -hmm. email open rates increase yeah. when you include a video or something like that, is that everybody gets it, right? And so if, if everybody's getting it or is just dead or you know never going to adopt video, sure. Um, I and mean, the people who have adopted video are taking a very, and, and I, one of the things that keeps me up at night is trying to find a different word for strategic because it, it's so often just a throwaway word, it, yeah. but they're taking a, a, a holistic, um, integrated view of how video works within their organization, uh, internally, externally to drive revenue, to drive brand awareness, to drive customer satisfaction, to drive employee satisfaction. And they know that among all of the things that they are using to treat each of those, video is one of those few things that can address all of those. Mm -hmm. And so there's just an understanding that even if they don't know how to do it, because I feel like that's where we fit in, mm -hmm. that video is the way to communicate effectively in all of those internal and external mm -hmm. channels. It's not the only way to communicate. Right. right. It is a very effective way. It is way a to very do. effective way. It is a way that we as an organization must be doing it. And we rely on people who've been doing this for five, eight, ten years, whatever it is, to to show us the way mm -hmm. on on how to do this. Because we know it needs to be done. We don't know how we need some we need to bring in the partners that that can show mm -hmm. us how. Um, 
and you know, the last part of that is a little bit self-serving, but I mean, it's your, it's your point, three year dream, <laughs> but that's the point of the question, right? Yeah. You get me to identify what, what my aspirations are. Yeah. If they haven't torn down this building in three years and we're sitting in this room doing a podcast episode or whatever we're doing, then talking about video trends for 2023 and you're really happy mm -hmm. about how companies are using video and, and us. What has changed in the last three years to make you happy? For years now, I've been sick of trying to convince people why video should be a part of their business. So to have that just be like, that's just part of the the bell-shaped curve. You know, yeah. when are people going to adopt this? And I would say in three years, if it's not, if we're not at early majority, then something's gone wrong. Yeah. Um. Like maybe there's a, a disease that breaks out and no longer can people see across in the in the U.S. Right. Then maybe video won't be so important. Like corneal virus. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm really happy. I I would say we're not in this little studio anymore. <laughs> we're probably in. Yeah. But maybe this is just our podcast studio. Right. And we've got a, a, a bigger studio. Yeah, this is the Video Reformation uh, brand studios. Yeah. yeah. I would like to be having more conversations with companies about that full step, that full seven phases. Mm -hmm. I'd mean, like to have conversations about that instead of just the production aspect. Yeah. We've been around for six years. It took us about that long to finally, now people understand the value of pre-production. Right. They used to just think you could walk into a room and shoot something yeah. and be done, and like, why does this cost so much? Hey, guys, are you available on Thursday? Because I, I have a client coming in. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I, th I think uh, it's taken that long for most people to realize that, okay, we should give them some lead time to write and location scout. Um, I would like for that to expand beyond yeah, just just the that mm -hmm. that second layer. Anything else? I'd be really happy for more. Some of those like uh, very high level, or just like um, like like uh, Zendesk, uh, HubSpot. So HubSpot has done a good job of integrating video. Um, Salesforce. Only the only reason that. Salesforce has a report because Vidyard, I believe, are the ones mm. who created the integration. Yeah. Um, but for these like these ERPs, these CRMs, um, to be able to better understand this, the video data and how it affects the um, the bottom line, I, I would love to to have a bet, better integrations on that front. Yeah. Because um, yeah, I think I think we're going to be surprised at how how big of an impact it has. Yeah. Um, no, I think that's a good one. I also think I'd like to add to mine to say I'd like to be having more conversations with clients about 268 video projects mm -hmm. instead of like one or three mm -hmm. or, or five. But like looking at what's the most we can get out of this. And I think a fundamental part of that conversation <clears throat> is a sense of a return on investment. And to, to be able to personalize some pieces of core content across industry or persona or job role or whatever it is. It's a simple way. It's a valuable way because it takes less energy to get from video 11 to video 200 than it takes to get from video one to 10, right? It takes more work to create the 10 core pieces. It takes less work than it took to do that to 10 X the amount of content. Mm -hmm. And so that we're having conversations with clients and companies are creating libraries that are mapped to their personas, their personas journeys, be they in marketing, sales, customer success, um, but they're fine understanding that they're gonna have to create 268 landing mm -hmm. pages yeah. or whatever it is because there's more value in that than just creating you know, 15 or 20 industry or persona agnostic yeah. videos. Yep. And and to me that is very advanced. You know, it, it relates nicely for this episode because that's the example we started with. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, that's that kind of advanced video thinking for a business is, you know, how can we get the most out of yep. this content? Um, Quick little recap here. Yeah, recap. So Vidyard has released their video trends for 2020. We'll put the link in the show notes so that you can view that entire report ourselves. Who knows? There may be upcoming podcast episodes for us the where we jump into some of the other trends that they break into. Um, they're, yeah, they're all very interesting. They are. Um, I think this one was like was one of the one of the most obvious, but like needed to be yeah, disc- like help people get there. I think yeah. I think today was, you know, today was essentially about video creation at scale, but it's, it's, you know, almost more like what you need to be thinking about video now as a business. Mm -hmm. And you need to be thinking about um, creating content throughout your organization, regardless of business unit, regardless of who's producing it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then all of the entanglements that, that come from that. Uh, having branding guidelines in place for video, having some kind of video enablement czar uh, mm-hmm. to uh, to assess how video is performing when it's that distributed, de- you know, and democratized throughout an organization, um, and you know, more employees using video. We talked about um, bringing existing employees in and leveraging their talents, like content writers. Good writers are going to be able to be trained to write scripts. Um, better than you know someone who doesn't have any writing experience at all, um, and you know we we talked a little bit about kind of the physical and and like technical requirements of scaling at that size, but also just the training and accountability resources that organizations mm-hmm. need to apply to. Um, we had a new sponsor this week. Um, they've paid for two readings, so I think it's time to all right. to read their spot again. If you recall, our sponsor this week is the old 98s. The old 98s, nostalgic for mid to late 90s post-grunge alternative music, but can't ever remember which band did which songs. Was that Tonic? Toadies? Third Eye Blind? The old 98s is a new 90s tribute band made up of members from some of your favorite forgotten post-grunge bands. The bassist from Space Hog? Got him. The guitarist from Candlebox? Yup. Another guitarist from Collective Soul? You bet. Forgot those were two different bands? We're the band for you. Drummer from Dishwalla? You know it. Hype man from Our Lady Peace? Amen, brother. I didn't even know Our Lady Peace had a hype man. I'm gonna look him up. Uh, Ezra from Better Than Ezra? Sure, why not? The old 98s. Wishing we had better lawyers before we were famous for those 15 minutes we were famous. Coming soon to a surprisingly small local music venue near you. All right. Uh, so thanks for listening to this episode. Thanks for watching on Instagram Live if you're still with us on Instagram Live. Thanks for watching this episode if we release this one in video form. Yeah, first we're filming um, a lot of these, but we have been filming. Finally got our shit together. Now we're in our new office. So um, ta-da! Um, as always, like, subscribe, rate, send, send us things. what you'd like us to talk about. Send nudes. us gifts. Send us nudes. Whatever. Um, yeah. Thank you for listening and watching the Video Reformation Podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs> In a couple seconds. No, we're probably going to watch we the next We won't see episode. you. You'll see us right after our outro banter because then you'll go to the next episode. Yeah. Yeah. We're a very binge-worthy podcast. Yes. I, that, that's kind of what our statistics look like. Yeah. This is People like just dedicate like their eight entire hours. weekends. Eight mm-hmm. hours. To catching up on like the last six yeah. or seven episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sometimes Sawyer doesn't even go to sleep at night. He just listens to our podcast. Well, he needs to know, right? He's the heir to the he, story. He will be, yeah. Them. For half of it. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure. I don't know much about that. Oh, no, I meant He's, like your half of it. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm going right. to spread your seed. Uh, you know, I don't know. Are you frozen, any? <laughs> I'd free some. Decon. Uh, Decon. What's up, dude? Uh, cool honey crates commercial you were working on yesterday. Mm. Uh, thank you. That's our in-office hair. Mm-hmm.